Economics is that dry and tedious subject affecting everyone while being understood by virtually no one. This is no accident, and there are those who richly profit from your confusion or lack of interest. As shown here, our chief investigator named Seymour is at the scene of the crime and is looking for your money. It's obviously not there, but if it was, what would it look like? If you think it's made of green colored paper with numbers in the corners and faces of important people from the past, then please think again by accepting this challenge. Identify the substance measured in dollars that Seymour is looking for, that government collects, spends, or wastes, or that banks pretend to lend, and claim 100 pounds of that money absolutely free from the address given at the end of this message. This is not money, nor is it $10. It's a banknote, or an IOU. Issued prior to the Great Depression of 1929, this note has a cleverly concealed contract that begins above the portrait, continues under the portrait, and concludes to the left of the portrait. Follow along. Top, the United States of America. Bottom, will pay to the bearer on demand, $10. Left, redeemable in gold on demand at the United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. A promise to pay $10 is not $10, and a promise to pay gold or lawful money is neither gold nor lawful money. Furthermore, this note was only backed by 40% gold. That's a pretty good profit margin. But if you get caught doing that, you'll go to jail. After opening for business in 1914 and having issued far more IOUs for gold than they had in their vaults, the privately owned Federal Reserve Banks and United States Treasury closed the redemption window in 1934 and confiscated the monetary gold that belonged to your ancestors. To conceal this crime from the public, the Federal Reserve System issued these replacement notes, changing part of the contract to the left of the portrait, removing the word gold. It now reads, this note is legal tender for all debts public and private and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. Legal tender is not lawful money. Lawful money had been defined by statute as gold or silver coin of the United States at Title 12 United States Code Section 152. After stealing your ancestors gold, the 40% gold reserve behind these notes would be unnecessary, right? But wouldn't you like to write $100 checks on a 40% reserve, knowing that they will always clear the bank, with no overdraft fee or demand for the unpaid balance? By this, you could legally steal the equivalent of $60 from anyone willing to accept your $100 checks. As profitable as this was for the Federal Reserve, Congress improved on it in 1945 by lowering the reserve requirement to 25%. Now they could steal $7.50 with every $10 note, or $75 on every $100 note. So they reduced the fine print left of the portrait, but worded precisely as the previous note. This would help to conceal their next important step. Immediately after President Kennedy's assassination in 1963, the Federal Reserve began issuing bogus notes worded like this one, but otherwise looking exactly like the three previous notes. All that remains of the contract are as follows. The United States of America, $10. This note is legal tender for all debts public and private. Removing the promise to pay $10 of the money, which was silver, did not convert this device into money, or silver, or $10. Nor can a promise to pay 10 oranges become 10 oranges by simply deleting the promise to pay them. Our silver coins were stolen in 1965, and in 1968 Congress reduced the gold reserve to 0%. It now costs the Federal Reserve and Uncle Sam nothing to get these rags and what you produce. They steal whatever they want. Taxes are a bonus and help to conceal the fraud. This chart shows the result of creating a central bank that opened in 1914. Karl Marx proposed such a bank as the fifth plank of his Communist Manifesto, which reads, quote, 
centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Compare this chart to Proverbs 22 and verse 7, which reads, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Consider this next graph in light of the Federal Reserve's mission statement to maintain a stable economy with minimal unemployment or inflation and stable purchasing power of what they call a dollar, which is simply a unit of measure in the decimal system. The dollars of imaginary bank credit you earn are worth only 3% of their value in 1914 when the Fed opened for business. Our forefathers prohibited this system in our state and federal constitutions. Our constitutional gold coins looked like measuring cups in grandma's kitchen. Their relationship to one another is precisely linked to the weight stamped on the coin in the decimal system of dollars and cents. The smallest coin, smaller than a dime, weighed one dollar, or 25.8 grains of 90% pure gold in the Troy system, where 480 grains equals one Troy ounce. This was a full day's wage for well-paid workers on the Panama Canal, which opened in 1914. The two and a half dollar coin weighed two and a half times as much as the one dollar coin and half as much as the five dollar coin. The ten dollar coin was ten times the weight of a 25.8 grain one dollar coin, so you simply move the decimal point to the right one place for a troy weight of 258 grains. The twenty dollar coin was double the weight of a ten dollar coin. Isn't it wonderful when things make sense? The common sense relationship among our silver coins in this image is likewise directly linked to the troy weight originally set forth in federal statutes and to their decimal weight stamped on the coins for ease of mathematical computation. This latter convenience was proposed by Thomas Jefferson. As you can see, however, the decimal system for measuring silver coins was different from the one used to measure gold coins and became the source of confusion. In 1853, Congress added to the confusion by reducing the silver content of all silver coins except for the one dollar piece, which people erroneously called a silver dollar. Intangible dollars were not made out of tangible silver. Confusion is the seedbed of fraud which ultimately led to the confiscation of our gold and silver many years later. Compared to our system of constitutional gold and silver coinage, the relationship among our copper-nickel tokens of today is an obvious absurdity, but then so is modern economics and the nomenclature upon which it is built. As a child, you may have questioned this absurdity by asking your parents how a ten-cent coin could possibly be twice the money as a larger five-cent token called a nickel, or how a one-dollar Susan B. Anthony slug is two times as much money as the larger half-dollar token. You may not have been impressed by their answers. The five and ten cent tokens are explainable, however. The ten cent piece used to be made of silver and was worth far more than a larger one made of copper and nickel. Natural law and common sense, as you may have noticed, mean nothing to people whose instant gratification throwaway lifestyle depends on bank credit. For more common sense truth in a world of toxic media, go to republicbroadcasting.org Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time for one hour of fresh air with Bruce G. McCarthy on Datum Line. Also available from the author, Lawful Money vs. Legal Plunder, a concise, well-documented book of 104 pages with color photos that unravels bank fraud and economic mysticism in language you can understand. Now there's a scary thought. Imagine turning off the TV long enough to dispel the crippling fictions of a mind-boggling charade. It's a challenge of a lifetime. Suggested donation, 15 bucks for one copy, 24 bucks for two. Price includes postage and handling. Order from BGM 33563, State Route 537, Graysville, Ohio 45734.